When the beaching axe fell in 1963, nobody could foresee the resurgence of rail travel at the beginning of the 21st century. Commuters on the daily grind into London Bridge or Victoria would probably disagree, but there is still something special about a planned train journey from London to York or Edinburgh starting from a station that not only has been restored to its former glory, but with a new wing that has gained unanimous praise. Next door to King's Cross is St Pancras Station. Architecturally, it dwarfs the former, yet it was scheduled for demolition in the 1960s, only to be saved when the Eurostar services to the continent were transferred from Waterloo. St Pancras Station, along with many other restoration projects at King's Cross, Paddington and Liverpool Street, are success stories in preserving the architecture of our railway past. But what has happened to other stations and lines that have been less fortunate? Today, trams and even buses run on former rail routes. Many can be walked or cycled, but capturing the public's imagination is the Heritage Railway. Most of them steam operated, running on lines rescued from the beaching axe. Tourist attractions mirroring their former glory and past. The first heritage railway to carry passengers was narrow gauge the Talathlin in Wales. The first standard gauge heritage railway to carry passengers was the Bluebell in Sussex. Both lines were closed before beaching the Bluebell in 1955. This was an alternative southern route to the coast via Lewis, but its northern track into London is still part of the National Rail Network. East Grinstead was an important railway hub, with a high-level station crossing over the existing southern station. That has long gone, now a car park for commuters, but the route of the line remains as a walkway and cycleway from the current main line at Crawley to Groombridge near Tunbridge Wells, renamed the Worthway and Forest Way. East Grinstead boasted rail routes in all four compass directions, but only one line remains as part of the national network. Ironically, Dr Beeching's hometown was East Grinstead. He is remembered by a ring road avoiding the town centre, following the route of the former railway called Beeching Way. Of particular interest to lovers of a railway architecture is Hosted Keynes Station. 
Simon Jenkins, in his absorbing book, Britain's 100 Best Railway Stations, also mentions Sheffield Park Station. Horsted Keynes is a complete example of a 1920s station in the southern style, with nothing to detract the eye and often hired for films and TV dramas. On a visit, don't overlook the buffet on Platform 4, and gentlemen, after refreshment, should you urgently need the toilet afterwards, please observe the notice before leaving. All authentic, of course. I wonder if there is a similar notice in the ladies. For many years after beaching, a London terminus was the only destination for a southern train leaving East Grinstead. But now that Thameslink has muscled in, other city stations are directly linked, including St Pancras and other stations further north. The former Midland Railway covered a far greater geographical area than today, now confined to Leicester, Derby, Nottingham and Sheffield, all served by East Midland trains. Until 1968 you could travel to Manchester from St Pancras, but the route that carved its way through the Peak District over viaducts and through tunnels no longer exists as a functioning railway. Manchester Central Station, which opened 1st of July 1880, was the terminus for the direct route from London that competed with the London and North Western Railway from Euston. With increased rail travel, today there are at least three direct services every hour from Euston to Manchester Piccadilly. Manchester Central no longer exists as a station. It closed 5th of May 1969. It is now an exhibition centre, but the shell of the station is preserved and looks familiar. Architecturally, it is a twin of St Pancras and the hotel also built by the Midland Railway, is still functioning across the road from the old station. Although some dream of the possibility, it is unlikely that the route through Monseldale and Millersdale will reopen as part of the National Rail Network. Today it is scenically a dramatic walkway and cycle track, with several tunnels that have been made safe and great fun to pass through. Monsell Head Viaduct is an iconic structure where crack expresses from London would suddenly emerge from a tunnel, cross a five-arch viaduct into a totally different world. Perched on a narrow shelf 90 feet above Monsell Dale, the line continued towards Buxton, treating passengers to some of the finest views in the peak. Like Hosted Canes, Millersdale was a large station completely out of proportion to its rural location. Both served important junctions and at Millersdale passengers from London would alight and take a connecting service into Buxton. Manchester Central no longer serves as a station but the modern trams that pass its door represent the latest in light railways. With the exception of Blackpool, where they still operate, the last tram service ran on 31st of August 1962 in Glasgow. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were hundreds of tramways. Today, their revival has dramatically improved public transport in Manchester, Sheffield and Nottingham, to name a few. In many cases, the routes incorporate underused railway lines, even some that are closed. Croydon's Tramlink follows the existing rail routes from Beckenham Junction to Wimbledon, but in town it shares the roads with other traffic, providing an important connection with East Croydon Station, one of the busiest in the country.
Possibly the most unusual and original alternative use of a former rail route is the Cambridgeshire Guided Busway. From the new Cambridge North Station, a branch line used to go west to Kettering via St Ives and Huntingdon. Much of the route is now served by buses, but between Cambridge and St Ives, the route uses the former rail route, now a dedicated busway, the longest in the world. Other traffic is prohibited. Modified buses that can also use roads are guided between two concrete beams up to a maximum speed of 58 miles per hour. Apparently, it is not essential for the driver to steer the bus. Just apply the brakes when necessary. It is amazing how a steam engine working on a heritage railway attracts an audience of old and young alike. Today, well over 100 exist in the UK, boasting engines rescued from the scrap heap by either running regular services, under restoration, or part of a static display. The most renowned display of static locomotives, some of which are in service for special events, is the National Railway Museum at York, opened in 1975. Here, the enthusiast will find the record breaker for steam locomotion, mallard, and, if you are lucky, the flying Scotsman when taking a break from active service on the mainline network. Some exhibits go back to the early 19th century and include curiosities such as Queen Adelaide's carriage, the oldest surviving royal carriage. Millersdale for Tideswell, Kirby Muxlow, Malcop and Scholar Green. No more will I go to Blandford Forum and Morty Ho On the slow train from Midsummer Norton and Mumby Row No churns, no porter, no cat on a seat At Chalton come Harney or Chester the Street We won't be meeting again on the slow train the Railway Museum has recreated in Station Hall how a station might have looked more than 100 years ago. It is heartening to observe how some of these historic structures and buildings still exist today, functioning normally and integrated into the running of a modern station. This has already been seen at King's Cross and St Pancras, but York Station 2, the home of the National Railway Museum, is a striking example of railway architecture on a truly grand scale, where to arrive really meant something. A pioneer of the railways was Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and in particular his groundbreaking route from London Paddington to Bristol. Paddington Station has been gloriously restored, its roof consisting of three spans, a central nave and two aisles. A fourth span was added in 1916, which in 2000 was saved from demolition. Sadly, the original and more modest terminus in what is now Bristol Temple Mead Station has been used as a car park, a far remove from its former glory. Although bombed in the war, the imposing entrance that came later still holds our attention. Imposing station architecture is not confined to London terminuses or the grand designs at Bristol, York and 
Newcastle. Passengers arriving at Weems Bay, heading for the ferry across the Firth of Clyde to Rossi, were greeted by an architectural marvel worthy of a great city, a design for a cathedral. It is a wonderful holiday send-off for passengers heading to Butte, and as we have also reached the end of our line, a fitting conclusion for this programme.